Welcome to Moving Medicine, a podcast by the American Medical Association. Here at the AMA, we believe patients deserve care led by physicians, the most highly educated, trained, and skilled healthcare professionals. That's why the AMA defends the practice of medicine against scope of practice expansions that threaten patient safety. Today's episode, hosted by Dr. Sandra Freihofer, immediate past chair of the AMA Board of Trustees, will address just that. Dr. Freihofer is joined by Kim Horvath, JD, Senior Attorney at the AMA Advocacy Resource Center, Derek Norton, Interim Director of Government Relations at the Medical Association of Georgia, and Sean Graham, Director of Government Affairs at the Washington State Medical Association. They'll discuss the unique challenges that states encounter when facing multiple scope bills, how to overcome these issues, and ways that physician advocates can get involved. Here's Dr. Freihofer. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Dr. Sandra Freihofer, AMA Board Chair, and I'll be your host for today's session designed to help keep physicians informed and engaged on issues impacting physicians, our patients, and our entire healthcare system. Today's topic focuses on inappropriate and unsafe scope expansion by non-physicians. We'll talk about the ever more aggressive efforts by non-physicians to expand their scope of practice and how this puts our patients at risk. Every year in nearly every part of the country, bills are being introduced that try to inappropriately expand scope of practice for non-physicians, including physician assistants, nurse practitioners, pharmacists, optometrists, psychologists, and other non-physician health professionals. In fact, legislation has been introduced in about two dozen states already this year that would change practice requirements for PAs, including amendments to provisions or totally removing requirements for physician supervision or collaboration. In my home state of Georgia, and thanks to a grant from AMA Scope of Practice Partnership, the Medical Association of Georgia was able to boost its advocacy work and successfully defeated two state bills that would have allowed CRNAs, that certified registered nurse anesthetists, to practice without any physician supervision. Our state medical society was also able to get a bill passed that strengthens Georgia's truth and advertising laws and increases healthcare transparency in our state. The Washington State Medical Association also received a grant from SOPP for their 2023 legislative session. They use this funding to strengthen on-the-ground lobbying efforts during a very busy legislative session. Multiple scope bills from a variety of non-physician groups were introduced. We're seeing increasing threats from unsafe scope expansions by non-physicians in nearly every state. Patients are at risk when non-physicians are allowed to practice outside their level of training and expertise. This is why AMA has increased its financial support of SOPP this year, raising our annual contribution from $50,000 now to $300,000 a year. The magnitude of this investment underscores the urgency of this issue. At the state level, during a busy 2022 legislative session, AMA advocacy, along with our federation partners, achieved more than 35 victories opposing inappropriate and unsafe scope expansions by non-physician healthcare providers. Numerous bills have already been defeated in 2023, and we'll talk about some of those today. On the federal level, scope expansions expected to be a primary advocacy focus of non-physician groups in this Congress this year. AMA has already organized a sign-on letter to the House Ways and Means Committee and to the Energy and Commerce Committee, expressing strong opposition to H.R. 2713, the Improving Care and Access to Nurses Act, also referred to as the ICANN Act. This legislation, which seeks to expand, expand scope of practice for non-physician health care providers, would endanger the quality of care received by patients covered by Medicare and Medicaid. AMA, as well as multiple evidence-based studies, strongly supports a team-based approach to patient care, in which each member of the team fulfills a clearly defined role based on his or her expertise and training. Physician-led teams 
are best for our patients. A recent study out of Stanford shows nurse practitioners practicing independently achieve worse health outcomes and use more healthcare resources than physicians. NPs also exhibit lower productivity than do physicians. Their patients have longer length of stays and higher costs. They achieve less favorable results. The Stanford study also found use of current staffing allocation of nurse practitioners and emergency departments results in a net additional cost of $74 million per year compared to staffing the emergency department with only physicians. In Hattiesburg, Mississippi, a study found care provided by non-physicians working on their own patient panels led to higher costs, more referrals, higher emergency department use, and lower patient satisfaction as compared to care provided by physicians. Study after study supports the truth we know. Physician-led care teams lead to better and safer care for our patients. NPs are not a replacement for physicians. PAs are not a replacement for physicians. An AMA survey confirms an overwhelming number of Americans want a physician involved in their care. In fact, 95% of US voters say having a physician involved in their diagnosis and treatment is important to them. AMA is responding and leading. AMA will always defend patients, physicians, and the practice of medicine from inappropriate and unsafe scope expansions. The panel of experts we have with us today will tell us more about where these battles are unfolding and where we've had success. Let's first welcome Kim Horvath, Senior Attorney at the AMA. Kim is instrumental in leading our scope advocacy efforts and has nearly two decades of advocacy experience in the healthcare space. She's a sought-after expert on a range of legislative issues. So, Kim, welcome and thank you. Our next panelist is Derek Norton, CEO of Top Spin Strategies. Derek's the Interim Director of Government Affairs for my own state medical association, MAG, the Medical Association of Georgia. Derek's also the mayor of the city of Smyrna. You know, I mentioned those recent wins in Georgia defending defeating scope uh, expansion bills. Well, Derek and his team were instrumental in those victories, and he'll tell us more about that today. So Derek, welcome. Also with us today is Sean Graham, Director of Government Affairs for the Washington State Medical Association. Sean joined WSMA in 2013 and has helped physicians in Washington State successfully advocate on a number of healthcare issues that impact patient care, including scope. Sean previously worked in a number of capacities in the Washington State Senate. So welcome, Sean. Kim, I'm going to start with you. Can you give us a broad overview of the type of scope of practice legislation we've been seeing so far this year? Yeah, thanks so much, Dr. Freyhofer, and thanks so much for the kind introduction as well. Um, so we've seen a ton of activities so far at the state level this year, and really no surprise. Um, before we started 2023, we did a survey of the state medical associations and national specialty societies and engaged their interest in scope of practice and what they saw um, coming for the, the upcoming legislative sessions. And, and just like previous years, about 86% of state and specialty societies identified scope of practice as a top legislative priority. Um, and I think that was a precursor to what has happened so far this legislative session, which is lots and lots of bills. Um, so in terms of trends of what we're seeing, we're continuing to see, of course, nurse practitioner scope expansions, but I think we're seeing a really increase in number of, for example, physician assistant bills. You mentioned about two dozen states in which we've seen bills that would um, expand the scope of practice of physician assistants, either um, redefining collaboration or essentially removing physician supervision or collaboration of physician assistants, sometimes replacing it with um, uh, collaboration with an employer or a hospital, which is of course not the same as with the physician. We've also seen about 20 states that would um, have had bills that would allow pharmacists to test, treat, and prescribe for uh, medications for things in which a CLIA wave test can be determined to be used to 
determine whether somebody has um, something like strep throat or a urinary tract infection, but then allowing the pharmacist not just to test for that, but then to prescribe medication for it. Um, we've also seen um, about a dozen states that have had bills that would allow psychologists to prescribe, and a number of states that would allow um, optometrists to either perform surgery or prescribe medications. Um, so again, no shortage in number of bills. We've seen hundreds of bills this year. Um, on the proactive side, though, I will say we have seen an uptick in truth and advertising laws, including um, states like Georgia, which have expanded their existing truth and advertising laws to um, cover things like um, titles, specialty titles. So we've seen an uptick in those bills. And we've also seen some bills um, in states where they've been a little more proactive and trying to preserve physician-led team care. And the AMA actually has model, um, model AMA legislation, again, supporting physician-led teams. So some states are using that as a basis to proactively push uh, uh, physician-led team legislation. So far, um, in terms of where we are with the legislative session, about 20 states have adjourned for the year. So that still leaves quite a few states, but there are many states that will continue to meet um, with, in their state legislatures for the remainder of the year. And there are a number of states that even if they aren't in legislative session, they will be having meetings, either working groups with legislators during the summer um, into the fall. Um, so this work on this issue doesn't end even if the legislative sessions have, have adjourned for the year. And um, we continue to work hand in hand with the state medical associations during that time, continuing to build out our resources to help them um, and just there as needed in this fight. You took care of the nation. It's time for the nation to take care of you. The AMA stood by America's physicians and patients during the pandemic, and we're not stopping there. We're fixing prior authorization, leading the charge on Medicare payment reform, supporting telehealth, fighting scope creep, and reducing physician burnout. It's time to rebuild, and the AMA is ready. To learn more about the AMA Recovery Plan for America's Physicians, go to ama-assn.org slash time to rebuild. Well, the work of SOPP is so important and you just describe challenges in every corner. Every time you turn around, there's some sort of new uh, issue that's coming uh, across our, our desk. So Derek and, and Sean, uh, your legislative sessions are now finished for the year. Can you give us an overview of the types of scope of practice bills you faced in your respective states and how you're addressing them? Uh, Derek, let's hear from you first. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Fryhofer. I'm so glad to be with you all today. And, and you're right. Thankfully, we finished our legislative session at the end of March. Um, it was a high energy session uh, this year with a ton of activity in the healthcare space. Uh, on the scope front, uh, we dealt with several issues. Uh, first and foremost was the CRNA independent practice fight, which was a huge battle uh, this year in Georgia. We were up against the newly appointed very powerful and motivated rules committee in the Senate, whose wife is not only a CRNA, but she was the current president of the CRNA State Association. So you can imagine uh, what we were facing there. We spent a lot of time educating legislators on uh, correcting misinformation. And I'll tell you that the $50,000 grant that we received with the Medical Association of Georgia from the Scope of Practice Partnership went a long way towards advocating and educating uh, in that space. We're so appreciative of the part that the SOPP played in this fight. And I'm pleased to report that we were successful this year in ultimately defeating this proposal. We won the battle in the Senate Health Committee uh, by two votes, a committee on which the rules chairman sits. And we won the House Committee vote by a wider margin of 13 to six. And I think one of the keys to success on this issue and others was keeping the focus on patients and patient safety. Uh, that really resonated with legislators uh, and particularly on this issue. We also faced a proposal to increase prescriptive authority for APRNs, PAs, and NPs to be able to order Schedule II drugs. And we were successful through the process, narrowing the legislation to what they could prescribe and how many days they could prescribe it. Uh, and the age of, of those they could prescribe to. But ultimately, after 
being able to scale back the original bill, uh, we were also able to prevent it from being called up. And so it ultimately died uh, this session. Some additional scope issues, um, among others that we dealt with this session were Senate Bill 164, which would have created a license for APRNs. Uh, another proposal that would have provided uh, for the licensure and regulation of community, uh, regulation of community midwives, uh, and a bill that would have allowed physical therapists to order diagnostic imaging and use ultrasound. And I'm happy to report uh, that all of those proposals were defeated. Uh, we also were proactive with the health care uh, practitioner truth and transparency bill uh, that addressed title misappropriation. And I think we're going to discuss that a little bit later. So that gives you a snapshot of some of the things we were dealing with uh, in Georgia this year. Well, Derek, you just had an onslaught of issues and it was a fight with a capital F for sure. And thank you so much for your hard work. I know you probably had many uh, sleepless nights, uh, just wondering what was going to happen the next day. But thank you for working so hard for the patients of Georgia and the physicians who care for them. So, Sean, um, what's been happen happening in Washington State? Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to be here and the ability to commiserate with everybody about our work on scope of practice. Um, and I, I know that we're all in this together. I don't pretend that WSMA has you know all the answers when it comes to scope. Um, if anything, the opposite might be true. There's a lot of bills that are annually proposed in Washington state because a lot of bills have passed here in the past. And um, for many of you, we're, we might be a little upstream from where you're at. Um, so you can think about this as kind of a preview of your future life. But uh, as is usually the case, uh, we had a long list of scope of practice bills in the 2023 legislative session. We also had a new wrinkle after 20 years of having uh, a, a chair of the House Health Care Committee um, who was a former nurse and who had become over her tenure in that chair position, uh, really kind of weary of scope of practice. Um, she retired. And so we had a new dynamic in the legislature and a lot of non-physician practitioners perceived that there was an opportunity to press their scope of practice issues that might have um, you know, been kind of sidelined for a number of years. And like a lot of other states, uh, we have legitimate workforce and, and access to care issues in Washington state. Um, we know that most of those scope of practice proposals that are considered won't positively impact those you know, workforce and access, um, but legislators don't always understand that math. So in terms of the bills that we opposed uh, this year, the, the primary bills, um, ARNPs, which are licensed and have pretty broad autonomy in Washington state, um, are proposing to be reimbursed at uh, parity with physicians for the services that they provide. Uh, physician assistants, as mentioned, um, want to move away from supervision and towards collaborative practice with a physician or an employer or a hospital. Uh, naturopaths, which are licensed in Washington state, had a proposal to increase their scope of practice to include prescriptive authority for all drugs, schedules two through five, uh, psychologists here proposed uh, a new ability for prescriptive authority. And um, as mentioned, we also saw a bill from the pharmacists that would allow independent ability to diagnose and treat certain conditions. Um, those bills were all fortunately defeated. Uh, the one bill that we opposed, which ended up passing uh, into law, unfortunately, was around optometric scope of practice. Uh, optometrists here had proposed uh, an increase in their prescriptive authority, the ability to perform injections, uh, broad surgical uh, procedures, as well as lasers. Um, what ultimately passed into law was a, a narrower version of that bill that did allow for prescriptive authority injections and some limited surgery, but no laser procedures. We also had a scope of practice bill that we supported here in Washington State, working with the anesthesiologists um, to uh, propose to license anesthesiologist assistants. Um, that bill got some consideration and will be uh, reintroduced again next year. And then there's uh, another host of bills that um, we might have had some concerns with that we were able to work through around medical assistants, athletic trainers, music therapists, yes, music therapists, um, behavioral health specialists, like undergrad degree uh, support specialists and certified peers, um, and then uh, international medical graduates, in addition to the scope bills in our state that, that we don't tend to engage on as directly um, examples around uh, dry needling and dental therapy. Um, so also want to say thank you um, to the AMA Scope of Practice Partnership. Uh, as noted, we were able to have some uh, additional on the ground support 
on the scope of practice issues this year. And I, I know that we would have had very different outcomes without the grant, without the support from the AMA. Well, Sean, you have really had your hands full. It sounds like, you know, they've been coming after uh, physicians in Washington State with both barrels. So thank you for all your hard work. And uh, it sounds like you had some good wins. I'm sorry about that optometrist bill. Um, has the governor signed that bill yet? Unfortunately, it was signed into law last week. And we had, um, working with the AMA and, and physicians in Washington State and beyond, had mounted a strong campaign, um, hundreds and and likely into the thousands of messages into the governor um, requesting a veto, but unfortunately it was signed into law. That really is unfortunate for the safety of our patients. So uh, I'm gonna stick with you for another moment, Sean. Um, you mentioned a lot of bills um, on a lot of different areas of scope of practice. So how did this volume of bills impact your advocacy and what advice do you have for states facing a similar volume and variety of legislation from various non-physician groups? Yeah, it's tough. Um, so our legislative sessions start annually in January. And if you talk to us, or if you heard of one of our staff meetings in November, we always have grand plans of how we're going to be focused on scope of practice. We're going to limit engagement. We're going to kind of ignore the noise. And then the second week of session, we're neck deep in scope and like we're sweating out a committee vote on a bill about psychiatric pharmacists or whatever. Um, the reality, you know, I think what we've kind of come to terms with is that we can't skimp on scope. If we don't do it, no one will. No one else is going to defend the profession. And there's probably no one who's going to look out for patient safety in the way that um, we will. So a couple of things that, that we've done. I mean, the first is to, to accept it you know, bake it into the agenda, know that you're going to have to allocate a significant portion of your resources on scope of practice, and make sure your physician leadership knows um, the calories that you're going to be burning on scope and how it impacts other parts of the agenda. Um, we also want to, you know, to Derek's point, we want to make sure that legislators know that our opposition to scope of practice bills is based in patient safety concerns and not turf wars. I think there tends to be, you know, an impression of legislators that this is all just about the bottom line, right? And, and making sure that physicians can make money. You know, our concern, the, the physicians that I hear from over the years and um, who engage on these issues are purely, you know, interested in ensuring that patients are re receiving high quality, safe care. Medicine doesn't stand still and neither do we. AMA members don't just keep up with medicine, they shape its future. Help move medicine, join the movement. Visit ama-assn.org slash moving medicine. The other thing that, that we've done uh, in Washington state is collaborate really closely with physician specialties. A lot of uh, physician specialties and physician organizations in Washington state have their own contract lobbyists. And so as things have evolved, you know, I kind of think about scope of practice in two buckets. One is those issues that are more specialty specific, um, as opposed to others that might be more general. So the optometry bill uh, that was proposed here this year, you know, we're going to work closely with the ophthalmologists. We're going to follow their lead and support them in opposing those bills, as opposed to uh, legislation around naturopaths or ARNPs that might impact the House of Medicine more generally, where we're going to be the lead on that and helping to organize um, physician organizations in opposition. The other things um, that we've done here, just briefly, hired a contract lobbyist to focus just on scope of practice. So thanks again um, to the AMA for the grant funding there. Um, and, you know, proactively work out the scope issues that you can during interim. I often feel like that's easier said than done. Um, you know, we don't want to be negotiating on a bad bill until and unless we, we have to. Um, but, you know, the last thing that I'd say is, making sure to use, making sure that legislators are aware of the breadth of scope of practice issues that you're fighting. A lot of times, you know, we might have a tendency to focus on these kind of on a one-off basis and not take a step back, realize the totality of the bills that are being considered. I think it creates an opportunity to talk with legislators and, you know, leadership um, of the caucuses and to point out all the different bills um, that we're fighting and to impress on them that, you know, you kind of got to pick and choose. You, you can't make us fight all of these and, and overextend our, our resources. So I don't, again, don't pretend that, that we have the answers um, necessarily, but that's some of the kind of tactics that we've utilized. 
Well, you have certainly been working very hard, and it sounds like also education is a big part of that. Losing that legislature that had been there for such a long time sounds like that was a big loss um, for you. So educating the people there on the difference between physician training and, and these non-physicians is important, as well as focusing on the patient uh, safety issues. So thank you so much for that. Um, Derek, I, I know Mag's uh, been working hard on and proactively on the truth and advertising bill while simultaneously and fervently opposing uh, several scope expansion bills. So tell us uh, about this dynamic. Uh, I know it was challenging, but having both things going, did it seem to be helpful? Uh, tell us what you went through. No, no, <laughs> it wasn't helpful. <laughs> uh, it was difficult, to be honest, uh, really, because as I mentioned before, we were fighting directly with the, the powerful Senate Rules Committee chairman on the CRNA issue. And we didn't want that fight to bleed over into our effort uh, to get the truth and transparency legislation uh, across the finish line. So it was a delicate dance. Uh, I can't stress enough how important our strategic partnerships became, um, particularly with the Georgia Society of Anesthesiologists and the Georgia Alliance for Patient Protection. Uh, their acronym is GAP. Um, as, as the session progressed. Um, just as a little bit of background, GAP was formed as a local version of the national group that many of you all might be familiar with, the Physicians for Patient Protection or, or PPP group. They've been active in Indiana and other states, um, but they have a mission to ensure physician-led care for all Georgians and promote truth and transparency regarding healthcare credentials. So as we partnered with them, they became the outward-facing um, advocate for Senate Bill 197, even though MAG and GSA were calling all the shots and um, pulling all the levers behind the scenes. So that way we were largely able to keep Senate Bill 197 off of the rule cha rules chairman's radar as far as it being a MAG priority issue, which was which was helpful and avoid any collateral damage from uh, other scope battles, um, including CRNA independent practice. Um, and it kept the focus on patients which was essential, as I said before, the bill's success. Ultimately, I'm pleased to announce that we passed Senate Bill 197 and the governor signed it into law. I was there, I got the pen in my coat pocket, and uh, so we're very pleased with this result. That is great news. And, and I would think that um, in the truth of advertising, talking about the different the differences between training was probably helpful and and getting the uh, legislators to focus on the different education and training that physicians have as compared to non-physicians. All of our experts today have been so incredibly knowledgeable and committed to making sure that we're advocating individually and collectively to support and defend physician-led teams to protect our patients and to protect the quality of care our patients receive. And we're extremely grateful for all of your time today. Don't miss part two of this conversation. Subscribe to the Moving Medicine Podcast anywhere you listen to your podcasts or visit ama-assn.org slash podcasts. Thank you for listening.